So, few comments about the lab so far. It's late. I have two minutes. Is that you? Yep. Or is somebody else? <laughs> All right. I'll take it. All right, so. <laughs> no, it's not. It's 223. <laughs> Give it here. Come on. The point is to be here. All right. A couple of observations about the labs. Um, one was, it is a really bad idea to put floating point operations in an interrupt service routine. The reason being that is that you want to keep it. No, it's, it's late. It's late. You have to keep interrupt service routines short. Right? You have to keep them short. And there's always a way to work around. There's always a way to work around floating point. So in the case that we're talking about here, we have some amplitude of a sine wave that you're getting out of some table. And you want to multiply it by a, a number in the range of 0 to 1.0. If you just use a table of 0 to 1.0, you're going to do a floating point operation. You could write this as a variable in the range of 0 to, say, 255 divided by 256. And that would also be a number between 0 and 1, more or less. But you could then factor that into sine 0 to 255 divided by 1 over 256, which is equivalent to just right shifting by 8 bits. So if you take your sine table, multiply by a number between 0 and 255, and shift right by 8 bits, you have effectively done a fixed point multiply between 0 and 1. So, <clears throat> students in general are not used to thinking about scaling of numbers because, after all, MATLAB is so amazingly fast and easy to use that why would you bother? But for little CPUs with limited arithmetic capability, it's a good idea to avoid floating point whenever you can. In lab three, using floating point for the multiplies will cost you a factor of two or three in performance, which you're being graded on. In lab two, it turns out you could get away with one floating point add in the interrupt service routine, probably more actually. How many cycles were in your interrupt service routines? How many CPU cycles? 900, okay, so around 900 or 1,000, something like that, because people were sampling at right around 40 kilohertz, and they were, and they were uh, running their CPU clock at around 40 megahertz. So uh, as far as I can tell, a floating multiply takes about 60 or 80 cycles. So yes, you had enough time to, to do that. You probably had enough time to do 10 floating point operations. But remember, while you're in an interrupt service routine, threads are disabled. So you, you sacrifice timing accuracy for a longer interrupt service routine. Does that matter? Everything's a trade-off. Second thing is, 
I've seen a lot of people, and I didn't emphasize this very much at the beginning, I talked about it a little bit. A lot of people have been walking over, pulling a DAC out, walking back across the room, looking at it, rubbing it on their arm, doing various things. And these are ESD sensitive devices. You can blow them up by touching them. And so the only really safe way of getting one of these out of the drawer is to open the drawer. And you'll notice in the bottom of the drawer is a piece of ESD plastic. It's a, it's, it's a metallic colored plastic. You put your finger on the plastic that grounds you relative to the integrated circuits. Then you pick one up and then you immediately put it in ESD foam. There's a pile of ESD foam sitting on the table across from the drawers. Put it in a piece of ESD foam, carry it back, put it on your whiteboard. That's very safe. I only know for sure that I've seen one blown up. Have anybody, has anybody had the symptom of a dead DAC? Saw one today. The symptom was the chip select line looked great. The clock line looked fine. The data line was only varying between the data line was only varying between 1 volt and 0 0.5 volts instead of between 3 and 0. And I believe that the input transistors on that pin on the DAC were blown so that it was a partial short circuit to the output pair. So the, the microcontroller could not drive the pin high and low. For a DAC, it doesn't matter so much. For a CPU, it, it's a pain. <clears throat> Another thing we've seen is that the order in which you scale and offset matters for the shape of the waveform. If you, if you scale then offset, you get a burst that looks like this. If you offset and then scale, you get a waveform that looks like this. The first one, scale then offset, gives you a waveform which is symmetric around the neutral point, which is right around VREF over 2, whereas this scheme gives you a floating DC offset which you may or may not hear. It's probably bandwidth limited enough that you don't hear that the, the, the component, the, the Fourier component. And we're not going to grade differentially on this at this point because we didn't really talk about it very much. But this is kind of inelegant looking relative to the symmetric version. Any questions about lab two? The only question I want to point out is that on that, the bottom waveform, how does it get clicking when I did that? You might, you might get a little bit of clicking because there is a, there is a significant DC, uh, there is a significant DC offset that occurs. Could you, you, you could actually hear it? Yeah. Okay, then, then it mattered. Anything else on lab two? <clears throat> so what about lab three? Now, oh yes, I modified the homework. One of the students pointed out to me that the homework that was online was still assuming that we we're using an NTSC monitor. And uh, so I modified it for the, for the LCD. And uh, any questions on that homework? Uh-huh. 
Uh huh. Interval? Yeah, so would it preempt <coughs> or So that interesting question is the question is if you if you have a high ball density, then you might expect that several events could happen at the same time. So you have a playing field, balls are flying in here, they're bouncing off of each other, they're coming they're they're being trapped by the exits to which you're trying to deflect using a, a paddle that moves back and forth. And you have to figure out a policy for what you're going to do if one sound has to start before the next one finishes. I think the most straightforward one is you replace the old one with the new one. So you just stop playing the buffer that was playing, reset the buffer and play it again. These are all going to be relatively short sounds. These are not going to be, oh, you know, happy birthday or anything like that playing out of the speaker, although uh, that was just recently uncopyrighted, you know, last week. So you could use it, yes. Yes, you could. And my guess is that in the context of a game, that's not going to matter very much. Now, you could figure out a way of crossfading between. I'm guessing it's probably not worth it. Probably not worth it. These are all short. I mean, let, let's say these, these sounds are probably going to be on the order of dozens of milliseconds long. Right, you'll hear a little difference, but probably if you're if you're uh, if you're trying to actually play the game, you won't notice. <laughs> the paddle, by the way, the the ball ball interaction when two balls hit each other, they are frictionless. That is to say, all of the forces between the balls have to be on the line connecting the centers. They just slide past each other. The paddle, however, is frictional. So if the m paddle is moving upwards and a ball hits it, that's horrible. If a ball hits it going directly this way, after the collision, the vector will be will have a small component added from the upwards velocity of the paddle. You get to choose that scaling to make it playable. So you're going to so there's going to be an angle of incidence equals angle of reflection if the paddle is still. So if it's still, if there's no velocity vector and a ball hits it, you're going to get angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. If the, paddle, if the paddle is moving, there's going to be a velocity added in the direction of motion. So it's going to tweak the y velocity a little bit. Again, you get to choose the scaling factor between how fast you're moving the paddle and how much momentum that imparts to the ball to make it more or less controllable. And I don't have a good feel for what the scale factor has to be, so it's up to you. Except it has to be a, at least a little bigger than zero. And I think you'll want it to be a little bit bigger than zero. Because it makes the game, gives the game more sort of controllability, I think. So there are <clears throat> Any questions about the game dynamics? I think the one topic we still have to talk about, and I think I forgot to turn on the, is this on now, the speakers? 
You got anything back there? Got anything back there? No. Dead batteries. Okay. Uh, the one thing topic we still have to talk about is the analog to digital converter. Because the way you're going to control this paddle is with a screwdriver controlling a trim pot on the on the whiteboard. So it'll be single turn trim pot, trim potentiometer, and you'll have to move the paddle pretty much the entire width of the of the playing area using the single turn. The A to D converter on this particular architecture is fairly complicated. I'll show you a little bit of how it's hooked up and then we can sh I'll show you a software example or two the architecture defines 15 analog to digital channels but the package we're using has six, has nine. So there's going to be a MUX that chooses AN0 through AN12, there's 13, defined in the architecture, but not all of them are available. with a optional single channel MUX or channel scan. So you can specify a single channel or a channel scan which is some sort of mask that determines which channels are going to be uh, converted. This feeds into a differential amplifier whose negative input comes from another MUX which I'm going to simplify as just having two inputs. One is AN1 and the other is V ref low. So we're either going to subtract off V ref low, which by default is zero, or we're going to subtract off AN1. That makes, means you can make a differential amplifier. So you can make a differential voltage measurement here. What would you use that for? Ooh, that's an interesting idea, sort of velocity. The, the most obvious thing is to measure the current through a resistor by measuring the voltage on each end of the resistor. So you can use it for a current meter. But for right now, you're probably going to use VREF low as, as VSS, which is zero. <clears throat> because you only care about one channel for doing this, for playing this game, you are probably going to lock the, the multiple, input multiplexer onto one channel and not bother with channel scan. The output of this diff amp goes through a, a fast switch and charges a small capacitor called the sample and hold capacitor. So this is a sample and hold circuit. And for this particular architecture, you can separately control when the switch is closed and open and when the successive approximation 
converter actually reads the value on the capacitor. So there's a conversion clock. Conversion clock that feeds into the sample and hold. There's a sample clock. that feeds the sample and hold there are refer there's a v ref high and a v ref low input which is also multiplexed with a couple of other inputs but I'm not going to draw those right now you all know how a successive approximation adc works do i have to talk about that i do i do need to talk about it Okay, so for successive approximation, <clears throat> the total conversion time is related to the number of bits you wish to convert. The actually, the way this works is that the So the SAR then is going to consist of another amplifier, actually a comparator. So this will be a comparator. This is going to come from the sample and hold. The positive input is going to come from the sample and hold. The negative input is going to come from a, a DAC, a digital to analog converter. <clears throat> And the digital analog converter is going to first set the high order bit, set the high order bit and ask, is the output of this guy high or low? If it's low, we need to add more bits. If it's high, we need to subtract bits. So you set, start by setting the high order bit. You make a decision based on whether the DAC is high, whether the output of the comparator is high or low. So really we should be, run this up to high versus low. And then we either clear the high order bit and set the next bit, or just set the next bit, depending on, on the output of the comparator. So it's a binary search based on voltage. Is that enough? You want more? So the controller, the digital word, the 10-bit, oh, the, by the way, the converter is a 10-bit converter. A 10 -bit, this is a 10-bit converter. There's going to be a 10-bit digital word that drives the DAC, and we're going to increment this or dec increment or decrement each bit until these two voltages match. You could do this. You could do this. One, one possible way, which is much slower, is you set a counter to zero and you increment the counter until the conver until the, the the comparator changes state <coughs> so if you were to not do successive approximation but rather do a linear search you'd set this to zero you'd start incrementing it up to 1023 at some point the voltage output here from the DAC is going to be greater than the input the the comparator will change state and you know you found the right value. I'm getting very little return in terms of, in terms of expression, which means either it's stunningly obvious or it's completely incomprehensible. <clears throat> if you did a linear search, you would get, you would take on average 512 clock samples to find the right value. 
but you could instead set the DAC to half scale and ask whether this is high or low. And then on the basis of that, either go here or here in voltage. And then on the basis of that, go here or here or here or here and do a binary tree search of voltage, which would take only 10 sample, 10 sample times. Yes? Okay. So after 10 sample times, where the sample time is set by yet another prescaler, you will get a voltage out. Turns out that if you run this thing at full speed, to run it at full speed, to run it at full speed, you have to set the PB bus to the peripheral bus clock speed to 30 megahertz. If you set it to 40 megahertz, the system has to run slower because you can't quite make all the deadlines at 40 megahertz, so you have to have the clock, the, the prescaler rate. For, for reading a single for reading a single resistor that a human is changing, you're not going to worry about the maximum speed of the ADC, which is right around a megahertz. So you're going to read it probably at the frame rate of the update, probably around 30 a second to 15 a second. Oh, I did a test, by the way. <clears throat> you know the, 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 the TFT test program that has a little green ball going back and forth on it. I wanted to see how many green balls I could animate with, with Newtonian mechanics. And 10 was completely smooth. Those are balls of radius 4, by the way. 100 were f flickered hideously. But if I dropped the radius to 2, everything was OK, because the number of pixels draw, drawn dropped by a factor of 4. So if I'd gone to radius 1, I should get another factor of 4. That's now 400 balls. That's probably more than you're going to need for this lab. <clears throat> So, it's a 10-bit successive approximation. It's a mega sample per second if you can read it that fast. You can't take interrupts that fast, so you cannot read it a mega sample per second in interrupt service routine. You can read it a mega sample per second in main or by using a DMA burst, a direct memory access burst from the ADC to memory because that'll run plenty, that'll run three times faster. So the only real way of running the, the ADC at full speed is to do a DMA, use a DMA channel. Again, you don't have to do that for lab three. There, I said there's internal versus external references. Oh, yes, you can choose the output format in at least six different ways. You can treat the output format as a 32-bit word, as a 16-bit word, and at least a couple of more options, right-shifted, left-shifted, uh, fixed-point notation, a couple, of other, a couple of other options. I tend to run it just as a 16-bit integer output. Every single one of these parameters has to be set up when you initialize the ADC. You have to choose the sample clock here. You have to choose the conversion clock. You have to set up all of the MUXs. You have to decide whether you're going to go to auto acquire or manual acquire, and on and on and on. 
So the only way I could figure out to use this was to look at the pblive.h examples, which I linked up. But hopefully, the code, the demo code, will be of some use. I don't have a specific demo code for this lab. I just have demo that sets up the ADC. I may write a specific demo for this lab next week. But for right now, There's a, there's a section here called Analog to Digital Converter. And there's a fast DMA using a spectrum analyzer running on the television. But you're probably not going to be interested in that. You probably want to look at example two, which is ADC performance using an interrupt service routine running at 500 kilohertz. That's probably the most relevant one at the moment. It's still way, way faster than you're going to need. You are not going to have to sample in an interrupt service routine, although you could. So the interrupt service routine is straightforward. As usual, you clear the interrupt flag. You read ADC, buffer. This is not a channel number. This is a buffer position. Oh, damn, I forgot to say. Yes, on the output, on the output of the successive approximation, there are 16 registers. You can auto read up to 16 channels before you do anything. So this is saying, just take the output out of the first output buffer, buffer 0. <coughs> For this example, I decided to put the ADC in manual acquire mode. So that switch doesn't go closed until you say acquire, and then the, then the sample switch goes closed to get a new voltage. So as soon as I read the channel, the very next, next, next line of code is acquire a new sample. And then we just took the output of the, of the, of the uh, channel and did something to it. In this case, put it out of the 4-bit uh, um, DAC that's on pin 25. So once the ADC is all set up, using it is rather straightforward. You read it, and that's it. Setting it up, though, so uh, it doesn't even fit on the screen. So the first thing you do is make sure you close the ADC so you're not messing with it while it's trying to convert. Then you define a parameter which does various things, uh, including that we want to put the format into integer 16. We want to set the ADC clock to auto. And we want to turn auto sampling off, which means that we have to use the acquire command to start the next sample. If I turned this on, I wouldn't have had to put the acquire in the interrupt service routine. It would have acquired a new sample as soon as it finished taking the last sample. So one the control. <clears throat> Then we have a second parameter which has a bunch of stuff in it. What is the, what's the references? Uh, do we have to, do we have to check for offset? Are we going to scan? And which buffer are we going to use? So we're setting the VREF to AVDD AVSS. That's the top reference and the bottom reference. 
we're disabling the calibrate, we're turning the scan off, we're doing one sample, we're disabling the alternate buffer, and we're disabling the alternate input, in other words, we're turning off everything. This one I played with a fair amount, was, which was to set the sample times. The, ca the conversion clock is coming off the peripheral bus. And I got to tell you, these sample times are pretty cryptic in the documentation, but this works at a frequency of 30 megahertz. But if you go to 40 megahertz peripheral bus, it probably won't work. Of course, you could divide the peripheral bus in half relative to the CPU speed and run it at 20 megahertz, and then it would work. So these are five, five something units, and TCY2 is some other set of units uh, for the sample time and the conversion clock rate. And I'll, I'll look those up and try and be a little more specific on those next time, because it is a mess. We're going to enable analog 4 input. And then do a set channel. Channel 0 is going to be negative. You're going to use a, a, a negative NREF. Channel zero is a, a positive is going to be on, on analog input four. And then we open the ADC. I strongly suggest that you don't mess too much with this. Unless you actually like read the documentation. because it's fairly involved. Any questions on this? This is kind of stunning for a Friday morning understand that. It's, it's a complicated peripheral. Yes? Why would you configure it to manual mode? So if, if you wanted to know just exactly when the time aperture was that that switch was closed, you might put it in manual mode. And one of the times you wish to do that is when you're using the CTMU, which I didn't say, but also has an input to the A to D converter, the charge time measurement unit, the CTMU, which is used to measure capacitance directly like lab one, but with less circuitry. And to do that, you have to be able to tell the A to D converter <coughs> when you believe the capacitor is charged and when to open and close the switch. One person in the class said, halfway through lab one, why aren't we using the CTMU? Somebody's reading the documentation. <clears throat> what else? I'm going to do some more on this next week. This is just to warm up your brains. There's a lot to do with this lab. You've got to start this weekend, folks. Yes.
mean that the next time we take from the buffer, that sample will hold us? Well, I guess we're going through a fast enough, but it kind of seems like the next one might be lagging. So the sample and hold is quite fast. And the reason they have a sample and hold is that when the switch is closed, the, the amplifier here has a low enough impedance to drive this capacitor at a full megahertz bandwidth. So it charges and discharges this capacitor extremely quickly. As soon as you open the, the switch, it freezes that voltage so you know the exact time at which you're actually measuring the voltage. If you were to leave this switch closed while you were doing the conversion, the bandwidth of the ADC goes down by about a factor of 100. Because you don't know quite when the sample was taken. And if the sample is taken, is changing significantly over the aperture at which you're doing the conversion, you don't know what value you should be comparing to the DAC output. So you have to freeze the voltage by popping the switch open. Then you can do the conversion knowing that the voltage was at a certain value at a certain time. The bandwidth of this whole system is about a megahertz. So you are not going to notice a lag. Jim, you have, do you have anything? Okay. You were standing there back there like you might need to say something. That's why I asked. Okay. So, so the core technology here is fixed point. Get the fixed point running, get the ball intersection stuff running. You could, do it, you could do a test which has some balls and you fire a ball at them and it should look like billiards. Or you should be able to do a static test with no input until you get the balls bouncing approximately right. You do that this weekend. Next technology then, and that's going to require getting familiar with the fixed point, which means looking at the example we talked about in the last lecture. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention. I modified the proto-threads page. I, I put this in mail. The proto-threads page has been... Uh, is dead. No, there it is. So there's now a new version. It's now called 1.1. I, I simplified the includes uh, uh, path somewhat. <clears throat> the config.h now does what it should do, what it should have done all along, which is to say it sets the the CPU frequency, of course. But it also then defines sysclock and PB clock macros that are used throughout the rest of the code to correctly set the timers. It also merges the TFT and non-TFT version by defining two macros that, that turn on and off features of the threader. So if you don't want to use pin 25 to generate a VREF debug, you merely comment this out. If you don't want to use the UART serial, you comment this out. So there's now only one version of the thread or not two. And the reason these have to be commented in or out is they take over physical pins, which means that those pins no longer work for general purpose I.O. So think about what you actually need for a given 
result. In lab three, you're probably not going to want to use either of these. In lab four, you have to use this one. Along with this, there's now two separate examples with two separate zips, one with the serial stuff turned on, one with the serial stuff turned off. I would suggest, I strongly suggest, that you bother to download the new zip file and use it along with the animation example that we talked about last time. Yes. You have to set up the clock here and then copy it down there. Then you have to do the manual divide to take the sys clock to the PB clock, the peripheral bus clock. I will include that automat automatic behavior as soon as I figure out how to read back the system clock from the registers. I know how to read the PB clock, I don't know how to read the system clock yet. Some register you've got to look at, figure it out. And again, the animation code we talked about last time has the definitions you probably want to use for fixed point arithmetic. Along with a new type, which is called fixed 16. <clears throat> and you're probably going to want to look carefully at this, at this example. So on Monday, come with questions about the example. And I'll talk more about the ADC on Monday. And folks, tell your friends, number of people goes down to below 30, I'm giving a quiz. <laughs>